Um, so in terms of what we do, so I uh, own a company called Veteran Compost. I started in 2010. Uh, long story short, you know, if you want to hear the sad story, we can go to Whitlow's and get two beers at lunch, and I can cry in it for you. But what happened is I got out of the army after several years of doing uh, counter explosives. Not a lot of uh, counter explosive IED work in DC. Luckily, our streets are clear. So I had to find something else to do. So I was looking around at sustainable businesses and agriculture and discovered composting. So two thirds of what's in every trash truck in America every day going by you could be composted. So huge amount of raw material, huge demand for the end product. And uh, luckily at the time in 2010, not a lot of regulations and rules. You can kind of teach yourself and jump on in the business. So that's what I did. Um, started in 2010, it was a one man show, so it was me. Um, and uh, started it, first we started in July of 2010, between July and December of that year. Uh, made $350. It's not profit, that's total revenue. So that's probably the worst producing farm in North America for six months. So lots of bills starting up, and we only made $350. I could have bought scratch tickets and done a lot better. So um, I ended up taking a job. So, you know, I was working, got the thing going, and after 18 months, we pulled, pulled up and, uh, and broke even, and we've been profitable ever since. So since then, we've now grown. We have 15 full time employees. We operate three facilities one in Northern Virginia and Fairfax County one in Hartford County, Maryland, and we're building one in uh, Anne Arundel County, Maryland. So those three facilities, we have 10 trucks out every day uh, collecting food scraps and delivering compost. So what our business does is we go around the residential and commercial um, customers and collect their food scraps. We provide the bins, we pick them up, we dump out the compost bins, we wash them, and then we take all that material and compost it. And we do everything from seven gallon bins on people's doorsteps to dumpster quantities out of healthcare accounts. So. Um, and everything in between. So we, if you want me to name drop later, we can do that too. We have lots of well-to-do customers. Google, uh, the rain that's not. <laughs> just dropping this. Um, so what we do then is the finished compost. That's what we're really in it for, is we make this great finished organic compost and a bunch of different compost blends that we market to agriculture. Um, we are approved for organic farming, so by tonnage, <coughs> the largest potential, um, or I should say the largest portion of our product goes to organic and urban farmers. Uh, we also sell a lot to homeowners and landscapers, um, but mostly to farmers. Um, so that being said, um, and by the way, I have no agricultural background. I grew up in Columbia, Maryland, in Howard County in the Burbs, so very close to the mall. So, um, you know, I'm not an ag guy by, uh, by background. Um, so, okay, so the seven things I had that were written down here. So number one is, are you sure you want to do this? So. <laughs> It's not about wearing flannel shirts and drinking out of mason jars, like, which a lot of people we've hired over the year with environmental science degrees think that it is. This is really, really hard work. <laughs> it's really not as well paying as you think. And um, it's just really, really hard work. So if you're going to get into urban or organic farm or any conventional farming, just understand what you're getting into. And maybe you should listen to your friends and family who are saying, maybe do something else. <laughs> um, maybe I should listen. Uh, so along with that is, I'll say, and this is a problem across a lot of sustainable farming and urban farming is don't be ashamed, embarrassed, or um, afraid to make money, okay? So part of being a sustainable farm is being financially sustainable. And seven years of doing this and delivering to farms, unfortunately, a lot of our customers from seven years ago are around and some of them aren't because they had a lot of altruistic views about the world, which is great. We're all going to save it together, but you got to pay the bills to keep the farm going. So if you're getting into this, you really need to be as much about business as you are about farming. So that was my biggest thing. So if you ever want to read a book, uh, Gary Hirschberg, guy who started Stonyfield Yogurt, wrote a book called Stirring It Up. And his theory is very similar to mine is if you're in sustainability and you make a bunch of money, people will see that and they will get into sustainability. So you can become this person that draws people in. So if you're in urban or organic farming or conventional farming, and you're driving a sweet car, everyone's gonna say, I need to get into urban farming because that's where the sweet cars are. Just saying. So just don't, don't be afraid to make money because financial sustainability is as important as any type of sustainability. Um, number two is grow crops to make money. So the first like three years I was in business, my dad called my farm the laboratory because we were like tinkering with stuff, we were making mistakes, trying to figure out the right products and processes and equipment. And make all those mistakes when you're really small, but at some point you gotta figure it out. So the first year or two that you're farming, if you wanna try 30 different varieties of stuff, cool. But after a while, you gotta find what works. So we, I have an urban farm 
in the area that they grow like 30 varieties, but they'll admit after a couple beers that they really make all their money on herbs. So herbs are what pay the bill, the other stuff is really cool, and they know that, and so they make sure the herbs get watered and tended first every morning. So just know what makes money and make sure those crops, you know, you're reevaluating that year to year. Um, you know, in our example, we used to sell live compost worms, and we discontinued that product line because we figured out it wasn't part of our core business, and it wasn't high margins, and it was a live product that a bag of worms doesn't sit well in storage, they kind of die. So if we don't have a shelf-stable product um, that has low margins and it's not part of our core business, we had to discontinue that. So if you want worm poop, we're all over it, but worms themselves, we don't sell. A um, Couple other nuggets here, there's a fine line between hoarding and keeping things until you need them around farms. So just be aware. There's a lot of things we keep and we organize it in boards and pieces of metal and tools and someday we'll need that. And then at some point you gotta constantly reevaluate. Maybe we're getting a little low over there on uh, the hoarding. So you know be aware of that. Um, the ethnic food was great. That was one of the things I was gonna mention is uh, the last thing I'll say is just um, you know trends are really important in agriculture. Know what's out there and what's trending. So ethnic food is a huge one. Cut flowers are really big. Edible flowers, microgreens, and in our line of work, you know, we create products to serve those emerging types of farming. So we make a microgreen mix. We're making soil mixes for cannabis growers. You know, we're looking for ways to make value-added products out of soils. Which on the produce side, you make value-added products, you make more money. And on the soil side, you can do the same thing. So be aware of the trends and don't be afraid to hitch your wagon to that because there's you know ways to make better margins in that. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll say is, like I said, it's as much a business as it is about farming. So I went to a farming conference uh, out in Austin, Texas a couple years ago to speak. And on the bus ride um, from the airport to the conference, a um, bunch of people in car hearts and hats, and no one talked about nutrition for chickens, no one talked about uh, their hay fields, no one talked about anything farming related. Everybody was telling stories about how much they were making per part of the chicken. So it was like the, it was a business conversation, the whole bus ride. How much are you getting for chicken feet? Oh man, you got a lady buying those to make earrings on Etsy? I gotta find a lady like that too. And so the whole conversation was all about how to squeeze a couple more pennies out of every bird on the farm. So when you're doing this, just remember this is a farm business and you gotta make money to stay in business. So that's all I got. Mostly hire veterans, and if so, where do you find them? Right, so the company's called Veteran Compost, so obviously my branding is super original and well thought out, right? Very literal. So yes, most of our workforce, actually all of our workforce is either veterans or family members of veterans. Um, so in D.C., all of our staff in this area, we have seven employees that work in D the D.C. area, are all veterans. Uh, we've done, I mean, short of grabbing people off the street and bringing them to work, we've done everything but that, but um, we've done Craigslist ads, We've done a lot of veteran outreach, and then a number of our employees have come from um, Easter Seals as a program for veteran, they call it the Veteran Staffing Network, and so we've worked with Easter Seals, and we send them job listings, and then they find candidates for us. And so typically, you know, a lot of our hires, I know Carly had mentioned hire for personality, um, you know, that's how we do all our hiring, is we bring people out for a four-hour trial, and I give them cash. I don't know if it's illegal, I might be in trouble for saying this. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so we bring, everyone I've ever hired, what I do is, and I recommend this for anyone in farming, is everyone has, I love this work, I love it, it's great, I, outdoors. What we do is we bring everybody out for four hours. You get whatever the hourly rate is in cash at the end of the four hours, and we're gonna try out. And what I do is I typically walk away and I let, all, I let them work with the other employees on things and then I let the employees give me feedback. Are they gonna fit our culture? Are they actually hard working? When I walked away, they get on their cell phone and start smoking butts or are they actually doubling down and working hard? So that's what I recommend too, is for all the people you hire is try them out first. Um, but Veteran Staffing Network, we've probably gotten five or six people from there. And then Facebook, Facebook employment ads are free right now. So our last hire came via Facebook. We put, a, put that out it kind of went out to the universe and we got someone through that as well. But, you know, for us veterans, it ended up being a good, a good fit. Obviously, I started a company because I didn't have a job, so I'm trying to pay that back. And, you know, when we talk about hiring for personality, I'm hiring for the intangibles. No one has a degree in composting, it doesn't exist. So, I gotta train everybody I get, and I'm gonna train them the way I wanna train them, that's fine. So I'm looking for someone that's gonna show up on time, they're gonna work hard, they're not gonna break my stuff, they're generally not gonna steal from me. 
um, you know, and, and stay out of trouble. So you hire for the personality, and then we train them to, to do what we need them to do. So.